How many believes that we have a God that is all powerful, that is almighty? I need to hear it if you believe that. God, God you are stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is awesome and power. Our God, come on, sing it. Everybody say, our God is on my side. Come on, say it again. Our God is on my side. Why don't you tell three people God is on your side? Come on, get out of your comfort zone. Tell them. God's on your side. Quit fretting. Quit being down. Quit being discouraged. Lift up your head. Get your head out of the sound, out of the sand and look up to the heavens because God is still on the throne. Has all power in heaven and in So you got to get that part and in earth. That means where I abide, where I live, where I exist until I exist there. The God that's going to be there is the God that is here. Amen. I appreciate the presence of the Lord here today. I just feel good in the Holy Ghost. We are a, to all of our guests that is online watching, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us. Um, you're just a part of this church as those that are in the sanctuary, so have church in your living room. Wherever you're at, if you're in your car, have church, but be careful. Um, but we want to say thank you for joining us online, for being with us today. 
this is a party atmosphere. We, we believe living for God's the greatest life you could ever live, period. It's just, I love living for the Lord. There's nothing like it. Amen. It's joy unspeakable, as we used to say and sing about. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. And um, I know God, God has got good things in store for us for our future. I, I sincerely believe that. I'll try to, to hurt you. you. You can be seated for a moment um, until you stand and help me preach. Um, it, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a year. <laughs> um, a lot of demands. And uh, my family never had a quarantine. We, um, we, we have worked um, through this whole process. And... Um, I don't even know what bored it means anymore. I would have to look it up. Uh, so it's been a very busy season. Uh, I, was, I was raised by a father who was a minister, and he traveled, evangelized. That means traveled and preached for 45 years. So we traveled as a family. We did have a home, but traveled often. He traveled all the time. Um, and, and, and just this whole church thing, it's been a part of my life, even though I got away from God uh, way too long. And then he had mercy on me to bring me back. But my father, uh, being in the ministry and then me being involved in ministry, I've um, traveled a whole lot. This has been the least year I've traveled in my entire life. Life. Since the day I was born. This has been the least year that I have traveled. Traveling's kind of in my blood. Now this is home. This is where I stay. This is first. But I love preaching out. Everything was canceled. The engagements that I had this year was canceled. Preached out one time, a men's conference in California. If you remember that, the weekend I came back and preached that Sunday, that Monday, everything shut down. Um, and so uh, my wife, we had, a leader, we had our leadership summit in February where we go up to Kingsport, Kingston, Tennessee, somewhere, King something, um, East Tennessee, and, and all of our staff go there for a, a leadership summit and staff retreat every year. Um, and I think that's the only place that she's been this entire year. Uh, we haven't had a family vacation. Usually me and her will get away for a little bit just ourselves. We haven't been anywhere for anniversary. I said all that, say this, I'm leaving tomorrow. Bye. Okay? I'm just telling you, I'm gone. I'm gone. And after tomorrow, I don't own this. This is, I don't have a cell phone. Pastor Lance does not have a cell phone after tomorrow. Uh, we're going to get away for a few days, just me and her, and then we're going to figure out, you know, maybe our family in the beginning of next year or somewhere in the first few months or, or summer. We'll see. can take my kids away for a little bit. Uh, but we've been blessed this year, and God's done a lot of things for us. But we are, there's no, there's no time that we could ever leave and not miss something because we have a church that always has something going on. That's, that's a good thing. You understand that, right? So I'll always miss something. We will always miss something if we leave. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about First Wednesday. You want to be here. Listen to me. Uh, we haven't taken communion this year. It, it, this is a needful. We have one Wednesday night besides small groups uh, in the sanctuary uh, right now in this season. And so you want to be here have great attendance, take communion together. It, it'll be no longer than an hour and a half unless, you know, and if God moves, he can go as long as he wants. But uh, usually about an hour and a half is what we project uh, for that service. It's going to be awesome. And um, we have a great team here next, uh, uh, next Sunday also. Just a great team, great things happening. I'm just telling you I'm excited about the future of our local church and our assembly. Um, today, for all those in First Steps, today uh, we have a bunch that are graduating from the First Steps class today. Let's give them a hand right now. And we have launched that. We're not going to have it in December. We had planned on it, but we got to looking at all the events and everything and all the traveling. And we, and we, we got to make it, we're going to make it even better to come, come back in here in January. And um, we, we, we've already had to switch it. We're out of room, et cetera, et cetera. So we're excited about our, all our new folks. Let me tell you, if you're a guest here and you're new here, you're just as important to us and this church as some of us that's been here a long time. Do you understand that? You are important. We love and appreciate you. So, again, um, if you need me this week, pray and have Jesus speak to me in my dreams. And uh, 
Um, we have Pastor Hill um, takes call. Cindy Jones, our secretary. Um, Pastor Seth Harden. This will be his, he's starting this coming week. I'm glad they're coming on staff with us. Amen. All right. Um, thank you, brother. Brother Lance. It's Lance Smith, so I never knew what to call him Lance or Smith. Or, um, you've probably seen or read in the news um, where the USA just got its 51st state. It's called the state of chaos. What is chaos? Chaos. If you look up a definition of chaos, you're going to find several things, but some of the main is confusion. It's disarray, it's pandemonium, anarchy, and the list goes on. It's chaos. I would be right, I think I would be right in saying we are surrounded by chaos in our world right now. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's great chaos in our country. Um, racism, disunity, hatred, a pandemic, political corruption, Conspiracy, biased, biased media, rebellion against authority, rage, like I've probably not witnessed in my lifetime overall corporately, a rage against Christianity, um, censoring of, of, of free speech, and it just goes on and on and on and on. I think some of us this year feel that we know a whole lot more about chaos than we do about order. We, we, we're, we're being educated, right? Someone posted, I'm not turning my clock back on Sunday. The last thing we need is an extra hour of 2020. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Blair, for that word of wisdom. <clears throat> there, um, there's chaos not only in our world, there's chaos in our lives. Chaos in our lives don't stop according to the chaos in the world don't change. In our own lives, there's, there's sickness, there's financial trouble, family crisis, loss of loved ones or, or friends, trauma, fear, depression, anxiety. It's probably at an all-time high, if, if you was to look it up. And the list, again, it goes on in our personal lives. Someone once said, I, I do believe that God trusts me with trials. I just wish he did not trust me so much. Right? You ever felt that way? We would rather God trust us with order. I would. I would way rather God trust me with order than trust me with chaos. However, he does trust us with order, then sometimes we turn it into chaos. It's true. He's trusted me with order so many times, smoothed things out for me, handed me things on a silver platter, and I messed it up so bad that it became chaos because of choices, because of words, because of actions. So the definition of order, if I'm going to talk about order, is to arrange something in an, in an appropriate way, to bring calm, to have stability, to take the pieces of this huge, massive puzzle and try to figure out how to piece it together one piece at a time to make a beautiful picture. Can I tell you, this is what God absolutely loves to do. And so today I want to talk for a few minutes about this. Order out of chaos. Order out of chaos. Our scripture text is in Genesis chapter 1. And um, very familiar scripture, it's the Genesis, which is the beginning. So you open and you're introduced to God. It's the beginning of all things. Verses 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. It was in, everybody say, chaos. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And just those two scriptures alone are massive, okay? It's the foundation of everything to come. Evidently, the earth at this point was a giant mass of water. The deep refers to the waters that covered 
the earth. So the earth was chaos then. Uh, God's Spirit then moved upon the waters. This tells us that the Spirit of God does, n- does not avoid chaos. That's powerful right there. You think chaos. Where's God? Let me tell you, the Spirit of God does not avoid chaos. God actually moves into chaos so he can make something out of it, so he can create order. Genesis 1 and 1 is what God created, and the rest of Genesis 1 we find is what God made. And We've got to get this, and we're going to have a little Bible study, Wednesday night, a little Wednesday night. Bible study right here for a little bit. So God creates and makes. In other words, in the very beginning, God brought into existence the the essential material for all things. And in the following six days, He made from what He created. All right? Day one, God said, let there be light. God created. God then divided the light from the darkness. God made. Day two, God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. God created. God separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters and were above the expanse, which shows us that God made. Day three, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. I find it interesting that when God spoke on day three, that he did not bring anything new into existence. His word brought order to what his word created. His word brought order to what his word created. The same word that created the heavens and the earth is the same word that made or arranged the heaven and the earth. And and I can't get into all this today, but that's what God still does. That's what God's doing to you. That's what God has done and is doing to us. Day four. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. God created. God made the two great lights, the sun and the moon, to rule the day and the night. So God made. Day five. And God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth. God created. Then God blessed them to multiply according to their kind. God made. Created and made. The phrase according to their kind demonstrates an order. It demonstrates arrangement or orderly arrangement. Day six, and God said, let us make man in our image, God made. So God created man in his image, or God created man in his image, and God made man in his image. Uh, Do you see how God works to make order out of chaos? So God, God creates and then God makes. See, God created me. I was born of flesh. I am the procreation from the first creation, which was Adam and Eve. So God created and made, and then they procreated after that. Then after I was born, and when I came of age, God began to make me. I was created, but I must be made. God's got to make me out of something more than this falling sinful nature I was born into. Does that make sense? God works to make order out of chaos in all things. When we look closely in Genesis at the sequence of days, we will see that God created and made in cycles. I actually taught on this. I think I taught a series on it. In cycles, okay? When you study it, for example, hear me close, hear me close. On day one and day four, on day two and day five, on day three and day six, God performed similar works. It came in cycles. Day one, God said, let there be light. Day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. You see how one Helps the other. One launches the other. One ends up making the other. Day two, God divided the waters above and below the expanse, the firmament, heaven. Day five, God created fish, the sea, and the fowl, and the firmament. See what happens there? A cycle. He comes back around to make something out of what he's created. Everybody say it's a process. 
Day three, God made the dry land appear. Day six, God formed the beast and the man out of the ground. So, so there he goes again, going back to what he created to make something new. The six days of creation are divided into two sets of three. The second set of three builds on the first set of three. So it's a, everybody say, process. See, see, we want order now. Right? We want our problems, somebody help me. We want our problems fixed now. That's why we lay in, lay in bed worrying about tomorrow, worrying about the sickness, because Google freaked us out when we looked it up. Mm, that's preaching right there. I just knocked on everybody's door. Oh, my goodness, that's me. I've got this, and I've got that, and I've got this, and my pains are the same, and this and that. And we worry, we worry, we worry. Is that right? We fret what is to come. We worry about our future. When we can't fix it right now, we worry. But with God, it's all a process. Because time does not control Him. Time does not contain Him. Time does not stop Him. God began a work and then came back and finished the work later. Let me say that again. God began a work and he came back and finished the work later. God doesn't finish a work in us all at once. God works in cycles. I did teach a series on this because I remember telling you, and I've said that often here, I, I do believe that you don't judge somebody if they're on day one. You don't expect somebody that's on day one to be at day six. We, we have this perception of the church where everybody looks the same, everybody acts the same, everybody walks the same, everybody talks the same. Well, that's not God's church because all of us on, are on different cycles and different days. Where I'm at now is where you'll be later. And where some of you are at now is where I'll be later. It's a process. That's why God's the judge. Because he understands what he's doing in you. Because he begins, he finishes, he's the one that performs the cycles. There were two realms in original creation, heavenly and earthly. The purpose of God for the heavens and the earth was for the heavens to whoo, rule the earth. I'm going to say that again. The purpose of God for the heavens and the earth was for the heavens to rule the earth. i got to get a drink before we go further on this one. Stay with me. On day four, God set the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, to rule over the what? You got it right. Don't be bashful. Well, the what? The earth. Okay? To rule over the earth. What happened in the heavens controlled what happens in the earth. The full moon in the heavens controls what happens in the earth. The sun in the heavens controls what happens in the earth. The heavens controlled the earth's light, the seasons, the seed time, the harvest. The heavens, the, all, the farmer's, what is it called? Almanac, is that right? Did I say it right? Farmer's almanac. We'll speak in tongues right here right quick. Is, is ran by seasons, the heavens, the moon cycles, the sun, even the rain. What kind of forecast? What kind of winter? What kind of summer? Earth was fruitful and productive in its relationship because of the heaven. God's goal in creation was to bring alignment between heaven and earth. To bring the right communication between heaven and earth. The earth cannot be productive without proper alignment and submission to the heaven. This demonstrates that God is not just concerned with the heavens. You listen to me. God is also concerned with the earth. Psalm 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and these that dwell in them. Let me say it again. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
the world and these that dwell therein. Look at somebody and say, that means you. That means you. The fullness thereof. Those that dwell therein is the Lord's. God will eventually renovate, redeem, and recover the entire creation, including the earth. Find it in Romans 8. 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21, God, hear me, will not surrender his creation. He will not surrender one part of his good creation to the devil. Everything that the first Adam relinquished, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, shall recover. The heavens always have and always will rule over the earth always have and always will this is called creational order right no matter what it looks like on the earth the heavens are still in charge <laughs> psalm 75 7 but it is god who executes judgment putting down one and lifting up another Isaiah 66 and 1, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me, and where is the place of my rest? Daniel 2 and 21, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings, and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, and knowledge to those who have under standing. So let me remind you something before we launch into the next few weeks of political pandemonium and constant chaos. We must understand that a man or a man-made system is not who is in charge. I'm going to tell you what my purpose is before I walk off this platform is to get you into the spirit and out of the flesh, to get you into the word and out of the world. Democrats are not in charge. Independents are not in charge. Libertarians are not in charge. Republicans are not in charge. Ronald Reagan was not in charge. Bill Clinton was not in charge. George Bush was not in charge. Barack Obama was not in charge. And President Donald Trump is not in charge. And whoever is elected this coming week or thereafter is not in charge. Let me preach to you the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is in charge. The earth is his and the fullness thereof. And the Lord Jesus Christ will have the final say. God is accomplishing his purpose with Donald Trump just like he had just like he has with every king and president before. And God will accomplish his purpose with whoever is elected in the future. If we believe God's word, we must believe this. If I did not believe this, I would crawl up in a fetal position and plunge into depression. If my life evolved around politics and man-made laws and man-made corruption, I submit to you this. I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. It's forever settled in heaven. It, no pun intended, it trumps everything else. Are you hearing me? The word of God is over everything else. Everything must submit to his word. Everything on the earth must submit to his power. Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands to this God. Is he big enough for a hand clap? I'm going to tell you how we lift up Jesus in one way. We lift up Jesus by clapping our hands. We, wish, we lift up Jesus by praising his name. We lift up Jesus by exalting him. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. God inhabits the praise of his people. When we walk in here on Sunday from a week full of frustration and bad negative news, corruption and junk, somebody needs to lift up Jesus higher than you lift up the news, higher than you
you lifted up the gossip, higher than you lifted up anger and disunity, lift up the God that's in control of it all so people can have hope, so people can see it ain't over. He's still in charge. I'm going to be all right because my life is in the hands of God. Hallelujah. God's going to accomplish his purpose. That's right. So, yeah, I vote. I talked about it. I already have. Avoided the rush. I will do my part. But God's going to do his part. So I do what I can do. God does what I cannot do. God takes nothing and makes it out of something. God takes chaos <laughs> and makes order. All things work. There you go. There you go. That's good. Some of you know the Bible. That's awesome. Makes me feel better. Don't know too much because I'll feel dumb. I'm kidding. All things work together, 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 not chaos, together. All things, chaos, comes together, is put together, is mended together. For them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Do you really love God? Are you called according to his purpose? then God will put all things together for your good. America's hope does not lie with politicians' expertise. It lies with a Pentecostal experience. Are we the light of the world? Are we the salt of the earth? I'm trying to get us out of the carnal realm and get us into the heavens. America's hope does not lie with aristocracy dogma. It lies with apostolic doctrine that God can save you and God can change you and God can forgive you and God can set you free and God can save your life and soul. America's hope does not lie with compromising Congress. It lies with committed Christians. That's where the hope of the world is it's the church we must not pursue the fake news more than we pursue his good news and when I say that I'm not talking about any certain news network because most all of them are fake news never listen to me never judge the state of the church by the state of the union That's the case. The apostles would have never had revival. They had the greatest, one of the greatest revivals of all time. And their government process was horrible. They were being crucified, martyred. And the church, the Bible says, grew and multiplied. We must not, we must not judge the future of the church by the future of America. Jesus said, Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, I'll give you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'll protect you. I'll put my angels charge over you. Let me go back to this. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Not man. In the beginning, God first, then man. God created me. God will take care of me. God created this chaos. God's going to bring order to this chaos. I just don't know. I've done too much. I've been too far. I, let me tell you, the same God that gave you breath is the same God that can breathe his spirit on you and forgive you and turn your life around and wash you with his blood and make you free again. God began in control, and he will finish in control. He began in control 
and he will finish in control. God is the master at bringing order to chaos. He done it in the beginning. He has continued to do it ever since. And he will continue to do it, right? So, in the book of Ezekiel, and I must hurry, chapter 37, he tells how God took him in the spirit and showed him a vision. Okay, watch me. God took him in the spirit set him, and showed him a vision. Let, let's read it quickly. 37, 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord, he says, was upon, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. So when God set him down in this valley, okay, took him in the spirit, set him down to show him the vision of what was to come. He set him down in the middle of chaos, not order. You, you got to see the picture like Ezekiel seen the picture because we read it and it don't explode to us. These were not just dead bones, okay? They're, they were not just dead bones. They were dry bones. They had been dead a long time. They were scattered bones. So... They were dry. You watch me. They were dry. They were scattered. It had been a long process. I mean, surely if there would have been hope, the hope would have already arrived. It's gone too far, right? It was a mess. It was chaotic. It was totally out of order. There was nothing that suggested that life or order could come back there or that this mess could be fixed. There was simply no way. The bones were scattered everywhere. He did not know. I mean, when Ezekiel looked, how do you know what finger bone goes with what hand bone? How do you know what hand bone goes with what arm bone? How do you know? You get the picture. How do you know what goes with what torso? How? how? It's scattered everywhere. This situation was out of control, to say the least. He did not have the answers. God said, Ezekiel, I have a question for you. Can these bones live? Now, really? Really? Without even thinking? No. Absolutely no. As my father always said a thousand times, no. It's amazing, Ezekiel's answer. <laughs> He, he was, he's like, okay, God asked me this question. All right, so. And he just like throws it back in God's lap. He said, God, thou knowest. You expect me to answer this? You know what I'm going to say. God, thou knowest. In other words, God, I don't have the answer for this chaos. And when we don't have the answer, we live frustrated. In other words, Ezekiel will say, and God, if these bones can live, you are going to have to bring life to them because there is no way that I would even know where to begin to fix this problem. And to me, it looks like a problem that simply cannot be fixed. I will tell you, I will be honest with you, I know you think I have all the answers, but I don't. A little sarcasm there. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the, I don't know how to put broke, a broken world back together. I don't know how to put broken lives back together. I don't know how to put broken marriages back together. But I do know this. I do know we have a God that does know. And he does know how to put impossible situations back together. And he does know how to bring order out of chaos. And as most of you know, God instructed Ezekiel to start preaching to them, speaking to them. Can I break it down? In other words, speak to these bones, not what you see. Don't say, oh, dry, dead, crusty, disorganized, chaotic bones. No, that's what you see. Speak to what you want to see. So Ezekiel said, thus saith the Lord unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. What? Sometimes you just got to speak it even if you don't believe it. Because the more you speak it, the more you'll start believing it. 
He said, and I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh on you, and I will cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you, and you shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. All of a sudden, the Bible says there was a noise, a shaking, and the bones started coming over here and attaching to this torso, and a, and a hand crawled over here. Seems grotesque and creepy, but it's Halloween, and a, and a hand crawled over here and connected to an arm over there, and all of these bones started coming together, and the Bible says flesh came upon them, breath came upon them, and they stood up on their feet and became a great army. God said, Ezekiel, this is my power, not your power. This is what I can do with chaos. If you'll lean into me, if you'll trust me, I'm trying to push somebody into the hands of God in your life, in your world to know that God can do it. Mm -mm. Now, Now, this story begins with Ezekiel saying, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Boom. The story starts, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And then he goes into the story. And then he carried me in the spirit. And then he, and then he, and then he, and then he. But it starts with the hand of the Lord. At the very beginning of chaos, just like in Genesis, the hand of the Lord was upon him. If I want to guide you over or through something, If I'm walking in the woods, if I'm trying to cross a creek, if I'm my kids, my wife, I take them by the hand and go, come, come right over here. Just follow me, right? I got hands together. I got the hand of the Lord was upon him. When we lean into God, chaos becomes order. When we lean into the world, chaos becomes destruction. That's why we are having a country that is being destructive right now. People that are truly leaning, leaning into God are not killing, stealing, burning, creating havoc. No, no, no. True Christians let God fight their battles. They go to prayer. They understand their weapon. I wonder, please, just, just listen to me. Think. I wonder what would be happening in this world if every riot and protest that we have seen was a prayer meeting. Because the heavens rule the earth. When we lean into our ideology, what we think, me, 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 I disconnect from God because I think I can fix it. I think I know. I think I can make it happen. But when I lean into him, he brings me peace. He brings me order. He brings me joy. He brings me hope. And then he fights my battles for me. And then he orders my steps. The steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. Then I don't stress about all this stuff because I understand he's the one in power. And if I'm done wrong, he's going to avenge me. That is such a peaceful place to live. That if I'm done wrong, he's going to fight my battles. It, now I'm going to tell you something. Something I've learned about God fighting my battles, he takes a lot longer than me because I want to fight it right now. I want to vindicate myself right now. But God says, no, 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 you wait. You let me do it. Because while I'm fighting your battle and taking care of your enemy, I'm going to take care of you too. Because you got a bad spirit. And you need to forgive. And you need to learn how to let go. And you need to learn it's not in your hands. And by the time I do take care of your enemy, you're going to be sad that I did it. Because now you love them. Because I dug all the junk out of your heart and your spirit. What a great place to live in the hand of God. Whatever happens, I'm in the hand of God. Whatever takes place, my life is in the hand of God. I will take it to prayer. I will take it to prayer. I will cast all my cares upon Him. When we lean, the, when we lean into God, chaos becomes order. When we lean into the world, chaos becomes destruction. Well, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Do you? Let's get real. You ready? Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So it's not just, oh, I love Jesus, I believe in Jesus. It's action with, didn't, didn't we obey? I'm losing you. 
Y'all really got hungry then. I got to go get my kids out of kids' world. He says, so if you love me, you will let me take you by the hand, and you will let me lead you where I want. Not, what, not where you want to go. You, you come over here. I know the path. I know what you need. I know where to take you. You will obey my word. You will seek and pursue my presence. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. See, if my wife loves me, she will obey me. I'm kidding. God. I'm kidding. It's the other way around. I don't know why I just said that. It's just, no, but in marriage, it's, it's, it's not like 50-50. It's 100%, 100%. I give up things for her. She gives up things for me. We, we somehow do life together by pleasing one another in this thing called, everybody say, life. Because I love her, I will do things for her. Like work at the house. Fix stuff. Go to stores. Shall I go on, right? And vice versa. She will let me hunt when I want to hunt because she loves me. Which this year has only been once. But you see what I'm saying? If you love me, put actions with that love. Man, i got to hurry. Because he said my commandments are not grievous. Y'all still with me? My commandments are not grievous. See, see, see commands for children are good. Some, some of you young parents, you, you really need to get a clue. You re, I love you, but oh my goodness. One, two, three, one. You're going to count to 100, okay? You're saving you some time. I, I, I commanded my children to not play in the street when they were growing up. I didn't ask... I suggest, baby, that you don't go in that street, right? I better not see you in that street. Those commandments are good. They protect my children. There's still commandments in my house for my children. Why? Because these commandments teach them how to live on their own when they grow old. It gives them order, stability, authority, and safety, right? I was picking on Nalen. I think it was yesterday. I was picking. We were joking. I said, I said, you know what? It's been way too long since you had a good whipping. That's what we call it. We whip. I'll whip you. I, I, it shows my age in deep south. It's been way too long since you had a whipping. I said, I think you're due one. I said, I bet you don't even remember the last time you had a whipping. He said, I think it was I was like seven years old. That's true. I said, that must mean you have a good father. He said, no, it means you have a good kid. <laughs> That's my boy. I really laughed out loud. And I said, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what it means, is that I have, I, is that I have a good kid. Now, let me tell you this. I'm not such a good kid, but I have a good father. And I'm going to trust him to walk me through chaos. I'm going to trust him to correct me. I'm going to, I'm going to trust him to convict me, to preach to me, and to speak to me. Everything around Ezekiel was chaos. But because the hand of God is upon him, he knows that God somehow is going to bring order of his chaos. Oftentimes in our personal life, it, it, we might be okay. We have food, we have shelter, we have transportation, we have health, we have everything. everything but everything else around us seems to be chaos. Then other times our personal lives are in chaos. And, and then there's other times where everything is chaos. Our world 
world, our personal lives. Some of you have been there this year along with your world being in chaos. You've had the worst health, health situations, financial trouble, uh, family trouble. Uh, and we have to be reminded of this one thing. Before it all started, the hand of God was upon you. When chaos started and he set you down, sometimes God lets us arrive to things we don't want to go to. But you better hear this preacher. He's brought me through it every single time. He's brought me through every bad day and week and year. Why? Because his hand is upon me. Took me in the midst of the valley. He set me down. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. God put him there. God put him there for a reason. God put him there to show his greatness. We are overcomers by the word of our, everybody say testimony. We're overcomers by the word of our testimony. So we have to have a testimony before we overcome. And we have to have a test before we have a testimony. So it all starts with chaos. So God often puts us in places of chaos and when we obey Him in those places, when we lean into Him in those places, when we trust Him and believe Him, He brings order out of it all. And He walks us on the other side of the valley as overcomers with a testimony. I know you might look around in your life right now, listen to me, and all you see is chaos. Things are scattered. Nothing is certain. That seems like there's no stability and you can't catch a break. It looks impossible, but it was God that brought you to this place for this time, for this season, and He did not bring you here to let you die here. He brought you to that place to bring you order from that place. And when he brings you order from that place, his greatness grows in your life. His majesty is magnified in your life. And you walk out on the other side with greater faith than you ever had to lead people like you never led, to be a testimony that you've never been. Would you lift up your hands and thank God for chaos right now? Come on, do that. Thank God for chaos. Because out of chaos comes order in your life. Thank God for trials. Because out of trials comes triumph in your life. Come on, we can do better than that. Just give it to Jesus for just a moment. Just lift your voice for just a moment. Ask God to touch you in just the next few minutes. I'm done. Praise singers are coming. The hand of God is on your life. You've got to get, you've got to make one thing for sure today. Listen to me. The hand of God is on your life. Sometimes you can't feel it. You can't see it. But that don't change the fact that it's there. I just don't feel like I have traction, Pastor. I'm just so confused right now. I feel like my life is just in this limbo. Good? Good? Does that mean God is setting some things in place to bring order? And He's going to show you His miraculous power. So I'm not going to lean into the world. One thing about this year, this thing called COVID didn't make anybody do anything. It brought out in people what was already there. I hope it has brought out in you a love for God greater than before. A sensitivity to Him. A, a trust you've never experienced before. A faith you've never had before. Are you with me now? I'm compelling someone to put your hand in his hand. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to compel someone to let him lead you and let him guide you. I'm trying to compel somebody today to say this is not about our country and our world. and This is about God. 
This is about good versus evil. This is about my soul, my family, what God wants to do in me and through me on this earth. Could anybody stand a blessing from the Lord? A renewing from God? A resurrection from God? Does anybody need a touch of faith today? Let's be honest. Come on, be honest. You got a rough week coming up. I'm just going to be honest. I'll be honest with you on that. It's going to be a rough week. That might, end, that, that might turn into other weeks. Can anybody use a special touch of faith and grace and mercy that will sustain you? You're in the right place to get it. And those of you online, it it can happen in your living room. It can happen wherever you're. The presence of God will come to. He knows how to bring peace to a storm. I was going to talk about Abraham and Isaac. I didn't even put it in my notes. Where where he learned to trust through chaos. He learned to trust. Are you with me? I was going to talk about several different things. Where they learned uh, like the storm for the disciples. And God, Jesus stepped up and spoke peace to the storm. In the middle of chaos. We learn to trust through chaos. We learn to have peace through chaos. We learn that he brings order out of chaos. Would you stand right now and reach out to him? Just all over the building, just reach out to him. God, I need you to sustain me. I need you to sustain me. I need you to sustain me. All I'm asking uh, is for us to move into the spirit just for a few moments right now. Could you move into the spirit for just a few moments right now? They're going to sing, and I I, I just want to invite you to reach out. If you want to come to the front, if you want to stay where you're at, but I'm asking you to give God just a few moments to let his spirit minister to you, let him touch you, let him wrap his arms around you. I wish you would put your hand in his hand right now and say, guide me, Lord. Lead me. Let me know that you're going to put all these bones where they need to go and you're going to cover them with flesh. Let me know that you're going to breathe life into this situation. Let me know that I might be only on the second day, but third day is coming and fourth day is coming. Let me know you're making out of me what you created me to be. That's it. That's it. Yeah. As they sing it, would you reach out loud? Come on. Let God touch you today. Let God speak to you today. Let God minister to you before you walk out of this building. the Holy Ghost touch you right now minister God to this congregation minister Jesus to this congregation minister to people where they're at reach out to him come on let your let the tears go let God renew you let God restore you let God encourage you let God forgive you Let God wash you. Let God resurrect you. My God will make a way.
Could you lift your hands and lift your voices one more time and give him praise for his spirit and his word today? Would you praise him for your future? God, I thank you for what is to come. I thank you for the weeks and months and years you have in store for me. I thank you for the recovering process, God. I thank you for your blessings and I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Jesus Christ, for all you've done and what you're going to do. I thank you that my hand is in yours. I thank you that you're ordering my steps. I thank you, Lord, for giving me hope when hopelessness surrounds me. And I thank you for bringing order out of my chaos. Do you think it'd be appropriate to give the Lord one more great big hand clap? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are you glad?